English for students. This is Ms. Tolson here and I'm going to make a short instructional video for you to go over the essay assignment for this lesson based on the play that we just finished reading and then watching also in the previous project which is Hedda Gabler written by Henrik Ibsen. So our essay topic is going to be why did Hedda Gabler commit suicide at the end of the play? And so, in order for you to come to your conclusion or form your opinion, I want to take kind of a, a bit of time to quickly go over the character of Hedda Gabler herself. So, essentially, what we should have come away from this is, is knowing that Hedda is not a nice person. She, she taunts a recovering alcoholic about his masculinity and kind of goads him into drinking again. She takes advantage of her husband's dying aunt to steal an ir irreplaceable document. And then she tries to trick a man into committing suicide and kind of takes pleasure in the romance of his death. So why does she do all of this? Well, there's several reasons. And essentially the short answer of it is because she's female and it's the Victorian era. And for those of us who weren't around to experience it personally, it really wasn't a fun time to be a woman. I mean, if you look at, your, at the text, for example, Hedda isn't allowed to hang out with a man unless a chaperone is around. Um, she's not allowed to go to the judge's party. She has to be careful not to use the word night when referring to the time she spends with her husband because, you know, that might imply sex. Um, and in this world, at this time, women are, aren't really supposed to do or say much of anything. It's kind of their job to sit around, look pretty, and compliment their husbands and tell them how wonderful they are. So tell, Hedda tells us herself when she says things like, you know, how mortally bored I've been and how horribly I shall bore myself here. And even more explicitly, I'm bored, I tell you. Hedda's boredom, is, it, it's likely the culprit for her kind of ever worsening machinations throughout the course of the play. You know, like little girls play with dolls. Well, Hedda plays with people. And why is that? Well, Essentially, it's because she finds it entertaining, and, and she does a great job at what she does. She can fake a friendship. If you check out her, her, her Act 1 conversation with Mrs. Elfstead, she fabricates motives in regards to burning the manuscript. She conceals emotions. But her greatest asset, really, is her ability to extract the information that she needs from others. Head is kind of like this walking confessional. Uh, everybody else seems to just be more than happy to tell her their secrets. She's really skilled at asking questions without ever answering one herself. Um, and so, I, I alert says it best. I used to make confessions telling you things about myself that no one else knew. And he, when he asks her kind of what powers in her made him do so, she, all she replies is, you think this is some kind of power in me? She answers the question with a question. So really, she got it. She knows what she's doing. In fact, only, the only character who seems to kind of get any truth out of her whatsoever is Judge Brack. And it knows this. And it really makes her very uncomfortable because she's kind of used to being the, the puppeteer, if you will, the manipulator. And she likes to, have, so to speak, have the upper hand. Now, what appeals to Hedda here is kind of the idea of power. Remember when Mrs. Elfstead wants to know why, you know, why are you manipulating Eilert like this? And her answer is, for once in my life, I want to have power over a human being. She considers Thea, quote unquote, rich for her influence and herself, quote unquote, poor for the lack of it. So if Hedda, being a woman, can't have power that's, say, political or monetary, academic, authoritative, or even professional, then her only option left to her is kind of her power to play puppeteer over other people's lives. And Hedda doesn't like her life. She tries to, you know, kind of live through other people instead. She wants what others, and by that I mean what men have, but she's forbidden to partake in. And so this is the reason for her friendship or closeness with Eilert in the past. She can't really step into that world and, say, drink carelessly or blow off her aristocratic family and, you know, kind of sever ties with them. She can't really be a renegade. So the closest thing that she can do to, to living in a way, in, in being, living vicariously, is through listening to his stories. So when she orchestrates Eilert's kind of perfect, su or perfect suicide, she's kind of continuing that to play the part, from, but from a safe distance of a life that she really can't ever step into. Now, since Hedda can't step into this other world, she prefers to the, the bury the head in the sand kind of approach, the 
I'm going to create my own little ideal world scenario. So in other words, she's more concerned with how things look, being able to entertain. She wants the world to be attractive and romantic and kind of even poetic. And so she retreats into this aesthetic, excuse me, world to avoid dealing with the harsh realities of kind of her crappy life. She even tells George, I don't want to look on sickness and death. I want to be free of everything ugly. So to her, Eilert is that romantic, tragic hero with the veins in his hair. Um, And then what could be more romantic and tragic than, you know, shooting yourself in the temple? But for all her attempts to escape reality, it's still there. It's still staring at that poor Hedda Gabler. She can't escape it. She's still just a woman trapped in, oh, say around 1890 Norway. And she might seem like a rebel or at least eons ahead of her time, but she's actually very much restricted by the social standards that she despises. And we see this best through Hedda's quote-unquote deathly fear of scandal. The fear of, the fear of scandal is kind of the reason that she broke things off with Eilert in the first place. You know, she married George because according to society, she had to marry somebody. Um, and she doesn't really love her husband. And But, you know, in the same token... She doesn't expect to be unfaithful either because, again, she can't risk the, run the risk of scandal. And then more importantly, Hedda has to keep up appearances. She might be maybe seething with rage and shy, but she has to maintain her cool on the outside, her outward appearance. And we know this is all taking a toll on her because we see that inner rage bubble up every now and then. But when she's finally left alone in Act 1, Hedda moves about the room, raising her arms and clenching her fists as if in frenzy. And then in Act 4 again, she clenches her fists in despair and declares that she'll die from all these absurdities. But still, she manages to restrain herself after every outburst, and she always manages to maintain her composure as kind of is, is expected of a woman in the Victoria era. So she hates the fact that she does indeed have to conform to society's expectations of herself, and she repeatedly calls herself a coward. She's a coward because she isn't willing to break the rules. She's a coward because at the end of the day, she's still trapped inside that parlor room. So doesn't it kind of seem fitting that she dies in the inner room behind the closed curtains? So this leads nicely into our next big question is, why does Hedda commit suicide? And this is our essay topic that you're going to be writing on. So now that you know, after both reading and watching the play, I want you to write a four to five paragraph paper on why you believe Hedda Gabler commits suicide.